a look at the therapeutic movement today. Welcome. It's another look into the life and message of Elizabeth Elliot, who called us to live to a higher standard and not be satisfied with just a little religion in life. As this series continues in the coming days, we'll hear from family, friends, and others, all influenced by the ministry of Elizabeth Elliot. Today we begin a five-part series on the therapeutic movement. With the first two of that Gateway to Joy series, Try God First is part one, and then later on today, Too Much Talk. We'll be joined by a friend of Elizabeth, writer Della Healy, who talks about what's important to know about Elizabeth. Also, we'll hear from Janet and Jeff Benj, YWAM authors. They'll talk about when they first heard about Jim and Elizabeth Elliot. First, though, it's the Therapeutic Movement Part 1, Try God First. You are loved with an everlasting love. That's what the Bible says and underneath are the everlasting arms. This is your friend, Elizabeth Elliot, beginning a series on the therapeutic movement. I want to start with some therapy from Scripture. It's in John 14, verse 22. Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said to Jesus, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching." My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you, but the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. I gather from the many letters that I receive from people who want counseling and many people who have been in professional counseling or are still in it, that what they're desperately casting about for is peace, the absence of fear, confidence. And they will pay fancy prices to go to professional counselors. There's a danger in this. And I make no apologies for warning my listeners. Our thinking has been infected by the secular therapeutic movement. It has infiltrated the church. It has changed the basic tenets of our Christian faith in some ways. Of course, we can't change the tenets, but we can certainly change the perspective from which we look at things. And if we are forever looking inside, trying to understand ourselves, dredging up the past, rummaging around in memories, some of which are false, I think we're in trouble. Now, the passage that I read to you from John 14 points up once again the radical nature of the things Jesus taught, the deep gulf which separates the world from his kingdom. Peace I leave with you, he said. My peace I give you, not as the world gives. The peace that Jesus can give to you and me is a totally different kind of peace. I had a letter from a woman whose husband left her. She was immediately advised to make an appointment with a Christian counselor. When I asked her why, she was quite taken aback by the question. She said to me, but Elizabeth, don't you think I need counseling? Well, this woman is a Christian. She's versed in the Word of God. Christ is the perfect counselor. Remember that Jesus promised his disciples that he would not leave them alone. I will not leave you orphans, he said. I will come to you, and I am going to send you a comforter. 
one who will stand alongside the Holy Ghost, the Paraclete, the Holy Spirit, who is given to guide us into all truth. The question that I always want to ask those who tell me that they're in counseling or signing up for counseling is, have you really gone first to the cross of Jesus? Have you taken it to Jesus? What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear, and might I say, oh, what needless counseling we pay for at times, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. And I can hear someone saying, but I've prayed about it. I've prayed my head off. I've prayed for years. It didn't work. My question then would be, did you wait on God for his answer? The church has always been equipped to counsel the mental and emotional sides of the personality. All the instructions that we need are there in the scriptures. I'm not denying that psychology has some legitimacy. I repeat, I do not deny that psychology has some legitimacy. But where do we start? On what foundations are these two disciplines founded? Like medicine, biology, astronomy, and physics, psychology can collect observable data, but it cannot offer any insight into the ultimate questions. Psychology and medicine are not necessarily in competition with the Bible. Now let's look at why the therapeutic movement and the recovery movement have become so widely accepted. One of the reasons is a theological deficiency among pastors. They simply don't know their Bibles. Some of them don't know God. Some of them don't know how to pray. Some of them are not well enough versed to realize how profound is the Bible's analysis of the personality. Another reason, the lack of respect for the competence of pastors and the unquestioned reverence for and deference to psychologists and psychiatrists. Number three, the biblical illiteracy that characterizes the average Christian. Number four, the attractiveness of the content. Five, failure to build churches that are relationally strong. The triumph of the therapeutic is therefore partly a spur to the church and partly a judgment, a further example of the unpaid bills of the church. In my most difficult times of my life, I have found the truth of Isaiah 43 too. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon you, for I am the Lord your God. My God has promised to supply all my need. He is my Savior. What does it mean to be saved? Does it mean a free ticket to heaven and nothing else? Does it have no transforming power in my present life today? He came to save us from ourselves, not to build our self-image, but to show us that we are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. And those are words directly from the Bible. That is God's estimate. Wretched, poor, miserable, blind, naked, helpless, sinners. And Jesus Christ, in his love and in his mercy, came to deliver us. And do you know what it says about our griefs and our sorrows? He bore them in his own body on the cross of Calvary. He bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. 
Jesus is a man fully acquainted with grief. He knows what it's like to be rejected, abused, hated, argued with, ignored, and ultimately killed. He knows what that's like. And we do not have a high priest that cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He was in all points, get that, in all points, tempted as we are, yet without sin. What kind of a high priest do you have? Is he a psychiatrist or is it the Lord Jesus Christ? I warn you, I beg you, I plead with you, try God first. Get down on your knees alone in silence. It's amazing how God can throw light on something which has seemed impenetrable darkness in our lives. If we wait for him, if we take time to be silent, maybe God wants you to find a prayer partner, someone to pray with. It doesn't have to be a professional necessarily. Any wiser, older Christian who has walked with the Lord, ask them to pray with you. May God reveal himself to us as Savior, Lord, Counselor, and Friend. Part one in our series, The Therapeutic Movement, Try God First. Later on, it's Too Much Talk. That's the title of part two in this series. Right now, though, it's writer Della Healy to talk about her friend, Elizabeth, and what's important for us to know when it comes to it. What is it that we should know about Elizabeth? That she was abandoned under the Lord, like the rest of them were, all of them, the ten of them were. And uh, they were guided and directed by the Lord to to go into ferreting out the Aucas and uh, Wadarani. She used the right words all the time. Uh, sometimes I'd have to have a dictionary next to me. I was reading one of her books. Unless we revive her writings, this was the thing about Elizabeth, okay? She taught objectively and not, not self-serving. It wasn't, it was objective teaching. Writer and friend of Elizabeth, Della Healy. Thank you, Della. Well, we're on to part two of our five-part series, The Therapeutic Movement. This is called Too Much Talk. So I'd uh, better let you get to it. We talk too much. God says, I have seen your sufferings. I have heard your cries. I know. And God has been reminding me of that. When I want to run off my mouth about something that has happened to me that was bad. The Lord says to me in that still small voice, is it not enough that I know? I have seen your sufferings. I have heard your cries. I know. My daughter Valerie called me not not long ago and she said, Mama, how much sharing is really helpful let alone really necessary. She's a pastor's wife, and it's a pretty dangerous business for a pastor's wife to be sharing much of anything about their private life or their home life because it will certainly be common knowledge among the entire congregation. But she's aware of the fact that there are certain people in the church who want to share everything with everybody, and they can become a very great burden to some of the other people in the church. And she and one of the wiser, more sensible, older women in the church had been discussing this matter of sharing. And so she just wanted my opinion. And I said to her what I said at the beginning of this program, we talk too much. I am convinced we do far too much talking about ourselves, our hurts, our pains. If we talk about our own pain, what about the people that have to listen? They've got theirs too. Is it really necessary? Is it not enough? that God knows. Psalm 147, verses 3 and 4 are good reminders, something that we need to remember and live by. It says, 
The Lord heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. The Lord does that. He determines the number of the stars and calls them each by name. Great is our Lord, mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. The Lord sustains the humble, but casts the wicked to the ground. Are you humble enough to be sustained? Are you brokenhearted? Are you wounded? Of course, we all are, we all have been, we all will be again. How about taking it to the one who names the stars and leads them out? He knew what was going to happen to you before you were born, long before the world was founded. And he's the one who knows how to heal your broken heart. One lady wrote to me for counseling, and the first thing she said was, don't give me any Bible verses. Well, she wrote to the wrong lady, of course, because I don't have any other kind of wisdom to give. And I wondered how seriously she has read the Bible. What experience of scouring God's book for what he wants to say in the darkest time. Ruth Graham told me that when she was in her teens, she went away to school, and she was terribly homesick. She was devastated at being away from home at a great distance. But she said, it never crossed my mind to go and tell my teachers. She said, that's when I learned to take my troubles to the Lord. As a teenage girl, the Apostle Peter wrote his epistle to exiles, people who were suffering in all sorts of ways. Let me read to you from 1 Peter 1, verses 6 to 9. He says, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him, for you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. He wants to save us every day from ourselves, from our selfishness, from our bitterness, from our resentment. We don't know how to find comfort because we haven't acquainted ourselves with him and with his word. The book of Job says, Acquaint now thyself with him and be at peace. Is the Bible superficial? Is it deficient? One well-known Christian counselor on the radio said to one lady who called in explaining her problem, this is what he actually said, this is not the sort of problem you can take only to God. And I would ask, suppose there were nowhere else in the world to take it. There are many people, by far the largest majority of the people in the world, have no access to professional counseling. But there isn't the remotest corner of earth in which everyone who lives there has not access to God himself. He is our wonderful counselor. He is the comforter. Suppose there were nowhere else to take it. The psychiatrist told the lady, this is not the sort of problem you can take only to God. I've been in situations where there was nowhere else to take it, where I suppose if I had been inclined, I would have sought counseling somehow. I would have been told at least that I should. It never crossed my mind. In Galatians 1, 11 to 24, Paul says, I want you to know, brothers, that the gospel I preached is not something that man made up. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many Jews of my own age and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. 
But when God, who set me apart from birth and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his Son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not consult any man, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was. But I went immediately into Arabia and later returned to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Peter and stayed with him 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I believe that it's most important that we take the principle that Paul used here and go first to God. Now, he was able to take three years in the wilderness of talking with God and listening to God. Uh, Very few of us would be able to do that. But it is a principle, isn't it? Take it to the Lord in prayer. Yes, Paul was an apostle. You and I are ordinary folks. But it might just be that there's a principle here. This is my plea. Spend time alone, silent, speaking to no one but God. That is the best starting place. People often say to me, but I have prayed. I did take it to God. I didn't get an answer. I wasn't helped. Perhaps you didn't listen. Perhaps you didn't wait patiently on the Lord. Did he show you perhaps in that silent time one matter in which you needed to obey? And did you? Did you obey in that one seemingly trivial thing? Now, what should be our response to the therapeutic movement? First of all, we need to maintain a right attitude. In 2 Timothy 2, 24 and 25, it says, The Lord's bondservant must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful, and those who oppose him he must gently instruct. Avoid anger. Avoid arrogance. Secondly, we must recognize the sufficiency of Christ, of his grace, and of the word of God. Christ is sufficient. My grace, he has told us, is all you need. In Colossians 2, we read, In order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden, listen now, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. Now let's think about the sufficiency of grace. You remember the context in which the Apostle Paul learned that tremendous lesson, my grace is sufficient for you. It was in the midst of pain. A thorn, he said, a thorn in his flesh. Now, that could be anything. It might have been a sharp physical pain. It might have been emotional pain. It might have been mental confusion. Whatever it was, it was something that he was bothered by, and he needed help, and he wanted to get rid of it. Where did he go? He went to God, asking him to remove it, and God's answer was no. My grace is all you need. There may be some listening to me today who will truly find that, after all, it was only grace that they needed. Part two of The Therapeutic Movement, Too Much Talk. Hey, do you remember when you first heard about the story of Jim Elliott and Elizabeth Elliott? Well, YWAM authors Janet and Jeff Bench talk about that. When did they first hear about Jim and Elizabeth? I was raised in the uh, Plymouth Brethren denomination in New Zealand, and uh, so their story was, of course, uh, Jim and Elizabeth were from the same denomination, so their story was well known within those circles. I was learned about Jim's death and the and the guys uh, in Ecuador uh, in Sunday school, and so we knew about that. And then my parents had a copy of Through Gates of Splendor, which, while I was it was an adult book and I was too young to read it at the time. I knew it was the adult story of what had happened to them and it was written by Elizabeth. So I was aware of both of these people from a fairly early age. 
And I think I became aware of Elizabeth Elliot uh, in the 70s when I started uh, reading her devotional books and her books on women. And then, of course, uh, when we started our Christian Heroes series, we wrote the book about Nate Saint and then one on Jim Elliot. And so Elizabeth is definitely a part of that story and we researched her in that context. But then we became uh, intrigued, you know, with what happened after that. Janet and Jeff Bench, authors with YWAM. Well, our time has quickly come to an end, hasn't it? But let me thank you for letting us come into your home, your office, as you uh, were getting some exercise, maybe, wherever we found you. On behalf of the Elizabeth Elliott Foundation, in cooperation with the Bible Broadcasting Network, let me invite you to check out elizabethelliot.org. Elizabeth with an S, elizabethelliot.org. For more talks, devotionals, videos, and other resources. A quick review from WZBNW7 on Podbean. Thank you for uploading these. They are a huge blessing to me. God is so good. Well, thank you for that quick note. And friend, it doesn't have to be a long note, but encourage somebody to listen. Maybe leave a review for us. Thanks. But until next time, may God remind you daily, you're loved with an everlasting love. Underneath or what? Yep those everlasting arms.